Live from Eyewitness News, this is Breaking News. Governor Gina Raimondo is giving us her daily update Tuning on the state's in. response We're to coronavirus. Let's listen in. At one o'clock throughout the crisis, and I would encourage everybody to tune in at one o'clock. It continues to be the best, safest, most up-to-date way uh, for you to receive information about the coronavirus as it relates to um, life here in Rhode Island. And to the extent possible, try to tune out the noise around what you see is happening in places like New Orleans, Chicago, Los Angeles, New York City. That's not where we are right now. And so keep it focused here, and we're going to do everything we can to get you the best, fastest, most accurate information to keep you and all the people in Rhode Island safe. Uh, today I'm sad to report our third death related to coronavirus. We now have 55 new cases here in Rhode Island, bringing us to a total of 294 cases. We have 35 people in the hospital. Now that's a big jump. That's a big jump, and that's a particularly big jump in the number of people we're seeing in the hospital. So what, what should you take away from that? You should know that I'm not at all surprised. This is what we've been planning for. We're starting to go up the curve. We're starting to whip the curve. We're starting to whip the curve at a pretty fast clip. It's what we've been anticipating. It's what we've been planning for. And it's, it is going to get worse. It's certainly going to get worse before it gets better. As I've said every day, how much worse depends on you. It depends on your willingness to follow the directions and keep a distance from other people. Um, what it, this isn't is a cause for panic. You should not hear this and get panicked. Tomorrow, uh, there'll probably be an even bigger spike. I'm telling you that now, so when you hear it tomorrow, don't be panicked. It's exactly what we thought. It's what we're preparing for. What it does mean is we all have to get a whole lot more serious about following the directions for social distancing. I am very serious about that. If you find yourself this week in a big group, surrounded by others, you're putting your life at risk, the lives of Rhode Islanders at risk, and making it almost impossible for us to do what needs to be done to keep Rhode Islanders safe and to eventually get to the business of turning this economy back on, which is where I want to get as soon as possible. Yesterday, when I saw photos of crowds of people in line in Narragansett lining up to buy food, clam cakes, chowder, take out food, all bunched together, I almost got in my car and went down there myself and broke it up. So I'm telling you right now, it's time to get more serious. These aren't limits that are suggestions for you to try to push. This virus is coming, it is coming fast, and we cannot outrun it. Which means if you're one of those people who owns a restaurant and not doing your best to keep a social distance among your patrons, you're doing something wrong and it's gonna be very hard for, for me to allow you to stay open. And the last thing I wanna do is to shut you down. And if you're in that line, or you're in a retail shop doing that, or you're crowded in your living room with the, fam with the neighborhood par party, you're just making it so much harder for us to keep you and your loved ones and the rest of Rhode Island safe. The whole point here is I'm trying to take an aggressive, pinpointed approach. I'm trying to leave as much commerce open as possible and trying to allow people to live their lives safely but with, a, with, with um, you know, a semblance of normalcy. So I am again here asking you, imploring you, directing you, begging you to please knock it off, follow the rules, and do the right thing. And to those of you who are following the rules, right now we, we still think we have about 50, 60% compliance. So to the majority of you, who've been stuck in your homes and are going stir crazy and, and are doing what we're asking you, I'm sorry it's so tough. And from, from the bottom of my heart and everyone who's working on the front lines, thank you. You are the heroes in this war against corona and literally you're saving lives. 
So I want to thank you and let you know I'm going to try to release these regulations as soon as it's safe to do so. Um, on that point, I want to acknowledge the struggles. So here we are, it's Sunday. Sunday's the day my family and I get up and we go to church as a family every Sunday. So we're, we're kind of down that we can't go and be with our faith community. It's also the day that we gather our whole family together for big Sunday night family dinner. And we can't do that today. And you know, I know the same is true for members of every ba faith-based community. Mosques, synagogues, churches, closed everywhere across the state. It's, it's really hard, and I wish it didn't have to be that way. But it does so that we can all get through this as fast as possible and as safely as possible. And so to all of you who are making the sacrifices that are necessary, thank you for doing it. I thought I'd ask all of us to do a couple of things today. The first thing is, let's all try to do one kind thing today for somebody in our lives. We're, let's be honest with each other. We're all on edge. We're all tired. This is weird how we're living. And we have weeks ahead of us. So just try to find one thing you can do. A kind word, biting your tongue so you don't say a, a mean word, calling, an, calling a neighbor, giving somebody a hand virtually, checking in on an elderly friend or neighbor, see if they need you to go to the grocery store for them, shooting a text to somebody. Just everybody today, try to do one, focus on doing one act of kindness so we can all get through this a little bit more easily. The second thing I'm asking you to do is today, it's the beginning of the week, write down the list of four or five people who you're gonna limit your interactions to in the week ahead. I, I want you to write it down. Because here's what we know about how this spreads. Yesterday, I ordered that social gatherings could only be five people or fewer. But we, we don't want you to be hanging out with a different five people every day. The whole name of the game here is reducing your number of contacts. If we're going to get a handle on this rate of spread, we have to reduce everybody's number of contacts so that if you are infected, you're in touch with fewer people. So everybody today, write down on a piece of paper who are the four or five people that you're going to reduce your contacts to in the week ahead. Yesterday, um, I covered a lot of ground, and so, and I th think may have created a bit of confusion. So bear with me, please, for the next few minutes, and I'm going to review the ground that we covered. What I announced yesterday is actually very similar to what I announced a week or two ago. A week or two ago, I said 10 people. Yesterday, I said five people as it relates to social distancing. I, I signed a stay-at-home order. Why did I do this? Because we're still only seeing about 50% compliance. So I felt it was necessary. I know it was necessary to get more stringent. But it's essentially what you should be doing already, which is staying at home. <laughs> Stay at home unless you have to go to work. You should be working from home. But if you have to go to work, then go to work and do it safely. You should not leave your house under any circumstances if you are sick, period. If you have to, obviously, you have to go to the grocery store. You have to get essential goods. You have to go to the pharmacy. You know, go ahead and do that. If you want to go get takeout, go get your takeout, come home. If you live in Rhode Island and work in Massachusetts, get up, drive to work if you must. Come home and stay at home. So moving from 10 to 5, it's the same rules. It's social gatherings. It's not workplaces. It's not healthcare facilities. It's the same rules that we had before. It's just moving from 10 to 5 because, frankly, we need better um, uh, compliance. People, we all have to do a better job of complying with the rules. And don't push it. Do not push the limits. Don't look for ways to get around the rules. 
look for ways to help you, your family, your friends, your coworkers to follow the rules. And that goes for folks in quarantine. It is brutal to be in quarantine. So if you know someone who's stuck in the house, see if you can help them. Starting tomorrow, all, as I said yesterday, all non-critical retail businesses must shut down their physical locations. I want to be clear that we're talking about non-critical retail only. These are retail shops, gift shops, clothing shops, and the like. I am not talking about restaurants. I'm still allowing restaurants for takeout service and delivery. In-room dining is still shut down. I'm not talking about manufacturing. And by the way, I want to give a big shout out to manufacturers. We're letting you stay open because we want you to stay open. And by and large, you're doing a terrific job with your social distancing. But if you're a non-critical retail business, you're absolutely allowed to stay open and encourage people to do online shopping, but you are not allowed to open your doors. Your physical presence on Main Street or wherever is ordered shut effective tomorrow. If you're a little business and you say, but Governor, I don't know how to sell anything online. I don't have a website. Then call 521-HELP and we'll get you up and running with a website. We'll help you learn how to advertise. We'll give you a hand and we'll do everything we can to get you through this. By the way, I don't want to be doing this. I have spent the entire six years of my governorship trying to get Rhode Island back to work. And until this, we were on a really great run. So rest assured, I'm only doing it because it's necessary. It's required to keep everybody safe. And I do still begin every day asking my team, how do we get this economy open? When, how, and how to do it safely? But at the moment, this week, next week, for some number of weeks, not months, I need everybody to follow these rules. Domestic travel. Yesterday I announced any person, I signed an executive order yesterday, saying that any person coming to Rhode Island by any mode of transportation after visiting any other state for a non-work-related purpose must self-quarantine. To enforce this, we have members of the National Guard at our airport, train stations, and bus stops, and the bus terminal. We also have highway signs directing all out-of-state drivers to pull over to information stations on the southern border with Connecticut. Why on the southern border of Connecticut? Because this is where most of the traffic is coming in. We may change that. We're gonna con we're, we may add more stops as we go. The situation is constantly evolving. The Rhode Island State Police will make sure that anyone planning to stay here in Rhode Island for non-work purposes knows that they are required, they are ordered into quarantine for 14 days. National Guard members will ask drivers to pretend, pre provide their contact information, which will be passed on to the Department of Health, and the National Guard continues to do walkabouts in coastal communities. The implementation of this plan was created in consultation with my legal team and the Attorney General. It stands in place, and if I need to expand it, I will do that. By and large, I will say, folks who are asking for contact information are very compliant. They realize we're doing this for their own safety, and so we will continue. Uh, child care. I'm sorry to say that I am about to make an announcement about child care that I had really hoped to avoid making. Effective tomorrow, we are suspending all child care licenses in the state of Rhode Island until April 4th. I'm only doing it for a week. This is a tough one, and so I'm going to take it a week at a time. After that, we're going to evaluate week by week because I am very aware that there are a lot of people who have to go to work, first responders, health care workers, some of us, and child care is essential. And I know how many people rely on these facilities. But, you know, yesterday and the day before, I've announced stricter regulations. A, 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 excuse me, a few days ago, I announced new stricter regulations that allowed some child care facilities to stay open. And so if I were a child care facility out there, I would feel um, 
whipsawed because I said one thing a week ago and I'm saying something else now. And so I'm sorry for that. But as I've said all along, when the situation changes, I need to change. And so I have new information now, and as a result of that new information, I just don't think it's safe for this week for child care centers to stay open. Yesterday, I told the people of Rhode Island that you can't congregate in groups bigger than five people. I cannot stand here today and tell you that it is safe this week to keep child care centers open. I wish it weren't that way. A week from now, I might have a better solution. I'm asking you to trust me that this is a decision being made with your best interest and your children's best interest in mind and on the basis of a lot of information, data, and science. I recognize you have to go to work and your children des need, deserve to be cared for. Um, I announced last week that Rhode Island has a special relationship with care.com. I would urge you to consider it. It's care.com. You can find a babysitter on care.com. It's, it's free to sign up. Care.com has waived the fee. Um, you can even find a volunteer babysitter or a babysitter that you can afford. They'll come to your house. Obviously, you want to be careful anytime you're letting anyone into your home. But uh, I know it's not perfect. I hope to have a better answer in a week. But for right now, it's something. Uh, Care.com, there's a special Rhode Island page. You can find a babysitter. You can find someone to, uh, an elder care sitter. There's a lot of Rhode Islanders who've signed up, and it's something I can offer you to get through the week. I will say on that end, um, I'm asking, I'm also asking Rhode Islanders if you're in a position that you can do some babysitting or do some elder care sitting. Um, if you are not sick and you are feeling you're able to do this safely, especially if you can volunteer and offer your services for the next week, please go on uh, care.com backslash RI give and offer yourself up as a babysitter. Two more announcements. Uh, Medicaid. It's more important than ever that Rhode Islanders have access to health insurance. As a result, I'm announcing today, Rhode Island Medicaid will be suspending all terminations and quarterly income verifications for the duration of this emergency. This will ensure that individuals on Medicaid today remain on Medicaid and have access to care for the duration of the crisis. The last thing you need to worry about right now is whether you're going to get kicked off of your health insurance through this crisis. By the way, that's what I'm doing in Medicaid, and I am saying that to commercial providers and employers. The last thing anyone needs to worry about right now is getting kicked off of their health insurance. Um, as a result, if you're on Medicaid now, you can stay on until the end of the crisis. Uh, finally, a special announcement with respect to DMV. We, as of now, we are giving Rhode Islanders a 90-day extension on expirations that occur in the, month, in the months of March or April. So that goes beyond the 30-day extension that I announced a few weeks ago. So if your expiration date was March 1st, you have until June 1st. So you have 90 days of an extension at the DMV for the time that the deadline was up, if the deadline is up in March or April. Um, this applies to all licenses, registrations, inspections, permits, and temporary plates. Check out the DMV website. You can still make reservations, and you can do what you need to do through the DMV website. With that, I'm going to turn it over for a minute to uh, Stephen Pryor, our Commerce Secretary, and then I'll come back and answer questions. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> and um, more broadly, thank you, Governor, for doing such a remarkable job every single day on behalf of Rhode Island. Um, uh, the Governor asked me to step up and talk briefly about the set of activities that businesses are permitted to undertake and the limitations that uh, have been imposed. And one of the things we want to lead with is that the governor has insisted um, that we create policies that are smart, that are responsible, that, that protect workers and customers, but also are as pro-commerce as possible. Uh, so we've been in the process of doing that, and what I wanted to do was clarify a few points about recent announcements. 
Uh, we've gotten in particular a lot of questions about the non-critical retail that needs to be closed or very dramatically change their processes. So here are my clarifications. Uh, first of all, yesterday's executive order was for retail businesses o only. There are a lot of states in the union that have done more uh, broad-based closures of non-critical businesses. That is to say, not exclusive to retailers, not exclusive to stores. The governor has tried to keep her interventions, her restrictions, her limitations as narrow as possible while maintaining public health and public safety. So yesterday's determinations and announcements were just about non-critical retail. Um, we did not shut down manufacturers or other service providers. Uh, so uh, the governor's already expressed that, um, speaking in particular about manufacturers today. Um, we want to say another uh, word or two about the manufacturers of this state. You all have been incredible. The level of cooperation that our uh, industrial leaders have been showing us, it's just phenomenal. And uh, the Rhode Island Manufacturers Association, led by Dave Chenevere in particular, has been an amazing partner. Uh, they are in the process of sending out a pledge for Rhode Island's manufacturers to sign uh, so that manufacturers are following best practices and the protocols of the Department of Health, informed by some of the federal authorities. Um, they're working hard to make sure all manufacturers know about best practices, including spacing employees at least, at least six feet apart, avoiding gatherings, for example, break rooms or cafeterias, um, screening employees for symptoms, not allowing people to come into the facilities uh, that they aren't routinely working with, if, if that can be avoided, not entering the, the physical facility, truck drivers and those making deliveries, for example, um, treating such people with respect, of course, but trying not to introduce new people to the work environment. These are the things that the Rhode Island Manufacturers Association and some of their partners like Polaris MEP and some key manufacturers that you all have been doing um, of your initiative in collaboration with us and we are so grateful and it's one of the reasons that the governor and we have confidence that at, for now we can continue manufacturing operations in Rhode Island. Um, so thank you very, very much and we ask uh, each and every manufacturer to be in touch with RIMA, the Rhode Island Manufacturers Association, about this new pledge that they'll be asking you to review and sign. Uh, now on to the retailers uh, of Rhode Island. Uh, I want to speak specifically to curbside pickup and delivery. Um, we've had a number of inquiries from retailers, such as small bookstores, as to whether we can do, we can authorize curbside pickup or delivery, and the answer on the whole is yes. So uh, for non-critical retailers who are considering a method of doing advanced orders via uh, a website or via phone-in, to that retail location and want to allow pickup or delivery, we are going to try to authorize that. Please be in touch with the Department of Business Regulation and our great director of that department, Liz Tanner. Uh, you can look at dbr.ri.gov, the website www.dbr.ri.gov, and you'll be able to both review information and also input questions, and we will get you responses as rapidly as we can. But we do want to enable you to use creative techniques to mail, to deliver, to allow pickup for your products because, again, the governor wants the most pro-commerce version of our policies as we can possibly frame and implement. Uh, next, um, appointments only. Um, in certain uh, very specific circumstances, we uh, are going to be allowing appointment-only scenarios where the, uh, the sector of the retail world won't function otherwise. Um, there need to be conversations with DBR, the Department of Business Regulations, and there needs to be a specific plan. But um, the cases that we want to describe for now are appliance stores and car dealerships where we've been getting inquiries about the importance of being able to take a look at an object, to take a look at a product. We will, under certain limited circumstances, allow appointments only. Please talk with DBR. However, I just want to offer these caveats, as the governor has expressed multiple times. 
we can't start to see crowds forming. We can't start to see clusters of people inside of retail shops. That's not permitted. So we ask for the maximum possible cooperation from retailers, and we're going to try to offer these very selective appointment-only scenarios, um, to, and if they work, we'll be able to maintain them. Um, so please work very closely with us, and please do consult with Director Liz Tanner and her, her colleagues at DBR uh, before proceeding with such plans. Um, finally, tech support. Uh, we know that for a number of retailers who are designated as non-critical, these are enormously challenging times. We are very eager to help you in every way we possibly can per the governor's direction. Uh, one of the key ways that the governor has organized is she has asked us to provide free tech support, free technology assistance to especially retail businesses, especially businesses of uh, 10 employees or fewer, um, the smaller mom and pop shops, the smaller retailers who just may not be online yet. You may not have digital payment ability, digital payment functionality on your website. Um, you may not have the ability to otherwise get uh, remote workers who may now be home no longer working in the shop to assist you in carrying out the work of your retailer. We have a tech support initiative that the governor has announced and that is operational and we're already helping businesses. Um, if that's of interest to you and you're a non-critical retailer or any other small business, please take a look at commerceri.com or call our helpline at 521-HELP. That's of course 401-521-HELP. commerceri.com or 521-HELP and we can link you up with a set of tech support professionals who are volunteering their time. Um, and as I conclude, I just want to share with you some of the phenomenal organizations and businesses that are stepping up to help. Uh, Sue Lee Co is our leader at, in, on the commerce team organizing tech support, but I'm just going to rattle off some of these names of our partner, uh, partner tech support organizations. We're so grateful to you for helping our small businesses. District Hall Providence, part of CIC, Tech Collective, Brave River Solutions, Vertical Six, Infosys, HCH Enterprises, and The Right Click. Thank you so much for stepping up in accordance with the governor's request, and I'm going to turn it back over to the governor now uh, so that the governor can answer questions. Thank you so very much, businesses of Rhode Island. I'd like to make one quick comment, and then I'm happy to answer any questions. The, what Stefan just went through is a little bit of a preview for you about how I'm thinking about uh, the process of reopening businesses, which is to say <clears throat> when it's going to be, we have to decide, but it is not going to be an on-off switch. We are not going to go back to life as it was. It, it's going to be a series of new regulations, which we are working on now by industry, in order to allow everybody to go back to work and do it safely. So just to start you all thinking, uh, the pledge that manufacturers have made that Stefan just referenced is the beginning of what's to come around us working together collaboratively to figure out new regulations by industry to reopen workplaces in a way that keeps us safe. All right, we'll begin with a question about the prison in Cranston. Has a confirmed case of COVID-19 at the ACI led you to reprioritize the possibility of early release for some inmates? It has not led me to reconsider or reprioritize that. We do have a good deal of information about that, though, and I'd like to have my director of administration address it. Thank you, Governor. Yes, uh, first to address the positive case at the ACI, the good news is, is that there does not appear to have been any co personal contact between the positive uh, employee and any inmates, uh, but that is, uh, that's both good news, but a, a function of the good work that's been happening at the ACI to plan for this crisis for weeks. We have taken all kinds of protective measures to ensure that both the staff and the people incarcerated at the ACI uh, are kept safe through this crisis. And, and we are working hard to make sure while maintaining public safety that we are taking responsible steps to 
uh, allow for additional distance, to be mindful of the climate within the prison. We know that just like this is a stressful time for all Rhode Islanders, it's particularly stressful those, for those who are incarcerated. We've suspended in-person visits, uh, but we've worked with our vendors. So for example, there are now uh, inmates are allowed two free phone calls per week, which was donated by our provider. Uh, we're allowing up to five free letters per week. And even those who are in solitary uh, confinement, which are normally not allowed uh, phone calls, have had that privilege restored. Finally, with respect to the prison population, we've, wanted to, we've worked hard with the Attorney General's Office, the Public Defender's Office, and the Parole Board to make sure that we're able to keep uh, the system moving so that those who are ready for release can be released. We've enabled uh, technology to make sure that the Parole Board can continue to meet. Uh, we've gone back and looked at people who are close to release to see if there is good, past good time that can be restored to accelerate their release, and we've waived the bail fee so that that people who are being held on relatively small amounts of uh, bail, there's an additional fee to pay bail, and that fee has been waived. Finally, in partnership with the Public Defender's Office, we're looking to see if there are folks who can be uh, held uh, at home prior to uh, any sort of trial or hearing. And so we're working hard in a responsible manner to make sure that we're still maintaining every appropriate level of public safety, but also um, facilitating what we know is an extraordinarily difficult time not just for Rhode Islanders, but even including those incarcerated. The last note I'd like to make is working in the, the Department of Corrections as a correctional officer or as a staff person uh, is one of the hardest jobs in Rhode Island. And the stress that they um, are going through at this time is compounded by the situation. And so we want to thank them for their hard work, thank them for their professionalism, and thank them for their cooperation through this time. Governor, just to be clear, will all cars with out-of-state plates be stopped at the southern border? And which doors will the National Guard be knocking on in coastal communities? Is it just New York plates? Yeah. So, I, <clears throat> excuse me. I'd like to answer this, and then I'd like to ask Colonel Manny to say a few words. Uh, two days ago, losing track of time, a few days ago, I did an executive order with respect to New York. Then yesterday morning, I signed an executive order superseding that having the regulations apply to all travelers from any state. Because again, as the data has changed, the situation has changed, unfortunately, the rate of infection that we're seeing in New York City uh, is, uh, so unfortunately, we're seeing that same rate of infection in other places, Connecticut, New Hampshire, New Jersey, et cetera. So yesterday, to keep all Rhode Islanders safe, <clears throat> I signed an executive order imposing a quarantine on all visitors from any state by any mode of transportation who are coming in Rhode Island for non-work purposes and plan to stay. Uh, and so that, that is what's happening and that's how we are enforcing it. But to that end, I would, it's Colonel Manny and his troops that are enforcing this, so I'd like to give him a chance. Thank you, Governor. <clears throat> I'll answer the question first, and then I'll go into the procedure so that there'll be no ambiguity. So the question is, will all out-of-state plates be stopped at the southern border? In which doors will the National Guard be knocking on in coastal communities? Just New York plates. The answer to that question is, all out-of-state passenger vehicles will be required to stop at one of the information centers on the highway and on secondary roads. We are working closely with the Rhode Island National Guard and General Callahan to come up with an operational plan to determine what the best allocation of resources in what communities and if they will continue going door to door. It will not be just New York plates, all out of state passenger plates. Not commercial, interstate commerce will not be impeded. As the governor outlined, the state police is working with the Rhode Island National Guard and the Department of Transportation to inform people here from other states about the mandatory 14-day self-quarantine. Today, we will have four information stations set up, Route 95 North at the Welcome Center in Richmond, Route 95 North at the Way Station in Exeter, the approach, Route 138 East to the Newport Bridge, 
and Route 1 and 78 in Westerly. The Rhode Island Department of Transportation will have signage directing out-of-state passenger vehicles to stop at the first information center in Richmond. Each driver will be greeted by a member of the Rhode Island National Guard and will be asked to provide their destination. If they are traveling through Rhode Island, they'll be sent on their way. Anyone planning to stay in Rhode Island will be informed that they will be required to self-quarantine for 14 days and will be asked to provide their contact information in their intended destination in Rhode Island. That information will be collected by the Rhode Island National Guard and forwarded to the Department of Health. If drivers follow the signs and stop as requested, they will receive information from the National Guard and be on their way. And they probably would not have any contact at all with the Rhode Island State Police. We are very hopeful that the people follow these directions and they will voluntarily stop at the information stations at the designated areas. If an out-of-state vehicle does not stop at the first information station that they pass, a member of the Rhode Island State Police will pull them over to direct them to the second information station, the closest one that they come to. We have clear legal authority to direct drivers to these information stations as I have outlined above. And I want to be very clear on this point. The procedure we have in place does not violate anyone's constitutional rights. When I was sworn in as a Rhode Island State Trooper approximately 30 years ago, I took an oath to support and defend the Constitution. I have never violated that oath and will not today. I'd like to thank all the Rhode Island first responders that are out there, especially the Rhode Island State Troopers, dozens of troopers and soldiers that are on, on this cold, wet day on the highways enforcing this executive order. Thank you, Governor. Governor, our next question is, here in the USA, we are very close to doubling the number of cases in China. Other countries, such as South Korea and Japan, were able to control the spread of COVID-19. And the question is, what are we doing wrong? Yes, so it's a very good question. I'll answer it in two ways. <clears throat> as it relates to Rhode Island, I want to remind everybody that we are four weeks into this and only have, and I, I say only, three deaths and 35 hospitalizations and 294 positives. By the way, the number of positives is almost certainly much greater than that. We're four weeks into it. Even in those other countries, it took them many more weeks in order to get a handle on it. That's why I continue to say to people, we're, be, we're starting to go up the curve, but we're gonna be working hard at this for a number of weeks to come. Secondly, in some of those countries, particularly in South Korea, they were much more aggressive around social distancing. You did not see crowds, four weeks into it, crowds of people lined up outside restaurants. They were, they were more aggressive. But, but as it relates to the country's response, the, the brutal reality is this country and its public health infrastructure was not ready for this onslaught. The federal government, since the minute we started this, has been playing catch up, and they are still playing catch up. At this moment, right now, I have teams of people here in Rhode Island working around the clock with me, scouring the world to purchase ventilators, masks, hospital beds, making provision to set up new hospitals with thousands of more beds in Rhode Island. We are doing that supported by the federal government, but essentially on our own. That, you did not see that happening in other countries. So all I can say is we weren't prepared as a nation. We are still playing catch up. Our testing, testing is a perfect example. South Korea was quicker, aided by their federal government, led from the top to have a robust, ubiquitous, rapid testing protocol. And we are still struggling to get that done state by state here in America. So what I can tell you, the people of Rhode Island, is that sometime this week, I plan to announce 
that we'll be doing 1,000 tests a day. And that'll get us in line to where South Korea was per capita. And I can tell you that we are readying ourselves to have 30 to 60 days of necessary PPE available to us at any time. Today, we are not there yet. And to that point, I want to make a special plea to um, uh, police officers and firefighters and such and mayors who are asking for more PPE. We're doing the best that we can and we're getting you everything that we can. We do not have enough right now. I'm going to tell it to you straight. And we have to prioritize the doctors and nurses who are literally hands-on in close contact with sick, positive patients. So we are, and I mean literally working around the clock. I have personally all night been on the phone with people in China, in India, all over the country, calling Director Gaynor, trying to get the necessary life-saving equipment that we need. And that's also why I'm asking you, directing you, to follow the rules around social distancing. Because a few weeks from now, our system's going to be in a better place. We'll have the PPE, we hope. We'll have the ventilators. We'll have the additional hospital capacity. We don't have it right now. So we need to slow down our ramp up the curve while we continue to pedal as hard as we can in order to get our system ready. And the answer to South Korea is they were more ready, the federal government was faster to act, and we're still playing catch up. Governor, our next question is, are there any plans to utilize the National Guard to assist quarantined individuals with obtaining essential needs? Yes, there are. So we are getting prepared to have many more people in quarantine. And in the coming days, in a day or two, I'm going to have more information to share around how we're going to enforce that quarantine, because we, we have to get more serious about em enforcing the quarantine. A big piece of that puzzle is making sure, if you're going to require people to stay at home, they're going to need a hand to get their groceries, get what they need. So the short answer is yes, that's on the drawing board. Uh, we're also looking at technology, you know, technology-enabled ways so that people who are at home on quarantine can track their symptoms, upload their symptoms into our database. As I've kept saying, information really is power in this. Uh, so. Yes, we're, we're looking at that. Yesterday you mentioned there's a greater focus on keeping the nursing homes safe. Are there any positive COVID-19 cases in our nursing homes in Rhode Island? Yes, the, <coughs> excuse me, yes there are, and I'm gonna have Dr. McDonald from the Department of Health uh, answer that question. Yes, yeah, so we've just learned about nurse cases in three different nursing homes. We're interacting with the medical directors. We're offering what advice we can. We are encouraging nursing homes when they have a new resident come in to quarantine that person for 14 days. And keep in mind, quarantine means someone who's not symptomatic. So if someone comes to a nursing home for the first time, they get quarantined for 14 days in the nursing home. And so we're working on this. We're obviously very concerned about nursing homes. We know that's the high risk population. So we're very concerned about this. That's why we're working with the nursing home medical directors to do the best we can for these people. Thank you. The next question is about the care.com system. With anyone being able to sign up on care.com, who is checking these people? Is there a BCI check, security review, et cetera? Does this not leave open our children and seniors to danger because people are desperate to go back to work? So the answer is there is a system, but uh, Director Courtney Hawkins, who runs DHS, who by the way has been doing a phenomenal job, uh, is the person who's on point here, so I'd like her to address that question and offer anything else you have on child care. Thanks, Governor, and thanks for the question. Um, you know, I think as the Governor mentioned, we want parents to make decisions for their family, and the purpose of the Care.com partnership is to just give parents more options during this time. Care.com does do background checks on everyone before they're posted to their site, and on their website they have more details about those background checks. They also have details about how to screen potential caregivers. Um, they provided ad additional screening information as it relates to um, how you might want to talk to a potential caregiver about their exposure to coronavirus. Um, 
you know, I'm a mom of a five-year-old, and so I know that there are big decisions that we have to make about the care for our kids, especially for those of us who have to work. And so I think parents need to do what they're comfortable with. I'm hoping that this opportunity, having a free three months of access, levels potential referrals so that parents who might not have opportunity to um, have a, a, an option like this do have the same opportunity that I might have for my family. Thank you. Governor, New York Governor Andrew Cuomo said at his press conference just now that Rhode Island has rescinded the executive order on restrictions from travelers from New York. And after speaking with you, he did this. Can you elaborate on the process of the executive order? Who was consulted and where do things stand now? Yes. So as I said earlier and as I said yesterday, yesterday I signed an executive order saying that all travelers from any other state by any mode of transportation are ordered into quarantine when they come into Rhode Island. So that uh, executive order, which I signed yesterday morning, superseded the New York executive order. Um, so I did talk to the governor of New York yesterday. He, it was after I had already taken my action and we chatted about it. Um, if he feels it's important for him to take credit, go ahead. I'm going to keep working here to keep Rhode Islanders safe. The next question is very similar, and you might have just answered this completely. Can the governor clarify the policy on plate and home checks for out-of-staters in light of Governor Cuomo tweeting out Rhode Islanders will no longer be stopping New Yorkers at their borders? Yeah. So again, I will say I think it's odd that Governor Cuomo was focused on this sort of politics at a time that we're fighting disasters, but I don't know how I can be any clearer. I was crystal clear yesterday. Colonel Manny is crystal clear. The National Guard is clear. I have a job to do, which is to protect you, the people of Rhode Island, and that's what we're doing. Um, and I wish Governor Cuomo all the best with the crisis he has on his hands. Next question is from a student journalist, Adam Zangari, at the URI Cigar, who's now studying at home. Many stores carry critical supplies, food, office supplies, automotive batteries, etc., as well as items listed as non-critical. How are these affected? I'm not sure I fully understand the question. Uh, stores that have stores that have those critical supplies remain open. The biggest of those stores, you know, big grocery stores, Walmart, et cetera, ha are operating under new regulations to make sure that there are never too many people in the store at one time and to make sure that people are spaced out in line. Um, the stores that I am closing, effective tomorrow, are non-essential retail. The biggest category impacted is clothing. And as I said yesterday, there is a list on the DBR website that goes through in great detail exactly what's closed and what's not. The final thing I will say on that point is I am trying wherever possible to uh, match up our policies with our neighbors. And so the list on our DBR website is quite similar to what you'll find on the Massachusetts site. The question went on to ask, how are you able to measure the 50 to 60 percent social distancing compliance rate? So we have a lot of people out and about. You know, I have the state police out, local public safety are out, our DBR inspectors, DHS inspectors. Um, we, we are out, you know, observing, counting. Uh, the Department of Health has a vast contact tracing uh, infrastructure set up. So it is imperfect. It is absolutely imperfect. By the way, some communities are doing a much better job than other communities, and I want to say thank you. There are some communities you'll drive around and it is a ghost town. That means you're doing something right. There are other communities where you drive around and there are mobs of people all congregated. You're doing something wrong and putting your lives and the lives of every other Rhode Islander at risk. To that end, who should Rhode Islanders call if they think someone in their neighborhood or community is violating any of the quarantine orders or your other restrictions? You, so there's a number of different ways. You could um, tweet out a picture. That has actually been incredibly helpful. It allows us to know where the crowds are and then we can go intervene. You could call your <coughs> uh, town, town uh, manager or mayor. Do not call 911. You could uh, log it online. We have a place that you can ask questions. Um, you could call 211. So just, you know, 
posted on Facebook. We're monitoring social media constantly as we see crowds, as we get tips. We are going out on a one-by-one -one basis. I know we're just a couple of days in, but how effective was the rollout to track down New Yorkers entering the state? New York governor is threatening to sue if you don't roll back on the practice. How do you respond to that? Yes, so he's welcome to sue if he likes. I think he would have a very hard time because I'm on firm legal ground. Uh, how is the effort going? It's going very well. What I would say is this. Um, on, there's a lot of hullabaloo, right? This is a lockdown. This is a police presence. Let me tell you what it actually is. This is an effort by your government to keep you safe by collecting information. That's all we're doing. We're collecting information. Do you plan to stay here? If so, where do you plan to stay? Have you tested positive? And we're getting that in and letting people know that they're ordered into quarantine. So it's going very well. We have, I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but I know the National Guard yesterday made hundreds of contacts. I know Colonel Manny and, and his troopers have been in contact with many uh, motorists. For the most part, people who are pulling over are grateful, which is to say they want to be here, but they want to be here safely. And that's what all I'm saying. If you want to be here, fine, but you need to follow the rules to keep yourselves and everyone else safe. This next question, I think we've answered it. Can we just scroll ahead to the last one for the last question of today's briefing? What does it say about our constitutional priorities when gun stores are considered essential businesses, but bookstores are not? Yeah, I'm going to let Stefan handle that. Thank you. Yeah, as the governor has indicated, we are trying to ensure that we have a set of policies that make the most sense, especially in the context of the region and the country in terms of closures and other business-related decisions. Um, this is a good example of that. So pertaining to gun stores, uh, it should be noted that firearm stores um, remain open in Connecticut and New Hampshire among states most proximate to us, and there's a variety of states, Maryland, Delaware, Virginia, Pennsylvania, where such stores also remain open. So we're trying to continuously monitor um, states and where they are undertaking openings and closings to make sure that our stores are not particularly disadvantaged because they're out of sync with the way policies are evolving in our region and our country. So firearm stores are part of that pattern. Um, there are other reasons. In the case of firearm stores, a purchaser uh, may be handling a firearm, a particular product or firearms in general for the first time, and we want to make sure that things like that occur in the safest possible environment, and that safest possible environment would be a gun store where the environment is controlled uh, and where the person can ensure that they are remaining safe. Um, so there are general reasons like that and particular reasons why decisions are being made. Uh, on bookstores, I want to reiterate uh, what the governor has encouraged us to do and we are doing, which is, uh, yes, um, requiring closure of the physical store, but we are very much encouraging bookstores in particular to reach out to our tech support advisors at 521 Help and let us help you enable online ordering and pick up uh, in front of your store or delivery at home so that you can remain uh, an operational business. Thank you very much. Thank you, everybody, for tuning in. We'll see you tomorrow. You've been listening Thank to you. Governor Gina Raimondo and state officials update us on their efforts to combat and contain coronavirus here in Rhode Island. So the big takeaways from today, there has been a third death in Rhode Island from coronavirus, 55 new cases since Saturday making it a total of 294 total confirmed cases, but the governor acknowledged there are likely many more out there. People just haven't been able to get tested. There are 35 people in the hospital, and the governor said we should all be prepared for many more, but she did say this is a significant increase, especially when looking at the number of people in the hospital. It was at 29 yesterday, and one of the big points that has been discussed in the past 24 hours is in the matter of people coming into the State from other states. So the governor clarified just now that any vehicle, any passenger vehicle without of state license plates will be asked to 
pull over at four designated areas once entering into Rhode Island from the southern border and state police and National Guard will be writing down people's information just so they'll be able to contact trace them throughout the state as we continue to deal with the coronavirus here. There are many more uh, points that they talked about in terms of the economy and small businesses and other businesses that are being ordered to shut down tomorrow because they may not be considered essential and you can find all of that information as well as everything else on our website at WPRI.com. Stay with Eyewitness News for the latest on this breaking story.